my mom used to come into my room and I, she would clean my room when I was a kid. And on the dust that would settle on the top of my desk, she would write jazz. And I would come back and I'd <laughs> wipe it off and I'd write rock. <laughs> <laughs> This podcast is about you uh, and your journey in music, and we'll talk about the new record you have coming out what, next month or November. November, yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, real quick, we share a birthday, which I think is cool. You're born oh. September 23rd. Exactly. Same day as Bruce Springsteen, Ray Charles, John Coltrane. Yep. We share. It was going to say, I, I knew, I didn't know John Coltrane, but I didn't know oh, yeah. uh, the boss. We shared a birthday with the boss. Yeah, and Ray Charles. And Ray Charles. And I don't know if you know Rachel Yamagata. Do you know her? I do not. She's a great singer songwriter. Also Both born, se also yeah. born September twenty third. It's a great. Day. It was a great day. Obviously, yes, it was. Um, <laughs> right on the cusp of Virgo and Libra. So. Right. What do you claim? Is my so you question. got all so you got all the craziness of both. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it depends on what calendar you're looking at because some people will say you're Libra, some people will go Virgo. Um, most things say Libra, and mm -hmm. I always thought Libra. That's um, what I was. Th I thought as well. Some calendars say September 22nd starts Libra, but uh, I don't believe it. <laughs> no. I'm, a, I'm, I'm always balancing, you know? For I'm, sure. I'm a balancer. I got it. Not very right. successfully sometimes either, but, <laughs> but I try. There you go. So you were born in New York? Were you born in New York? Uh, yeah, I was born in New Hartford, New York, which is upstate. Talk to me about that a little bit. Um, well... Luckily, for my music career anyway, and ah, for life really, because uh, um, I wouldn't have wanted to grow up anywhere else. We left uh, upstate New York when I was nine. Mm -hmm. So I was born up there and, and lived up in uh, the Utica area until I was about probably five kindergarten. Then we moved to Buffalo. Okay. And I went to uh, kindergarten through fourth grade in Buffalo. And then when I was nine, we moved uh, one all the way down, which was like, wow, you know, you guys are going to like Siberia, people thought, you know, <laughs> or, or we were in Siberia and we were moving to a civilization. <laughs> um, it was a good four or five hours from, you know, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. I mean, Buffalo is actually eight hours from New York City. So uh, it was like another world, you know, it went from rural um we lived outside of buffalo for a while we lived in the city and then and then we lived outside and you know i had a giant yard and woods and everything so i grew up you know like a kid there in the, in the woods playing and all that mm -hmm. and then uh but when we moved to uh an hour outside of new york city to uh new jersey um you know i got so much more cultural opportunities of course you know the just the mix of people, you know, I met my first Jewish people, my first black people, my first, you know, Puerto Rican people, uh, my first gay people, you know. Um, so uh, it was, an eye um, you know, up there, I, I guess I was too young to kind of realize who was different, who was what, you know, I mean, you don't mm -hmm. think about these things when you're four sure. uh, or five or even nine, really, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of, uh, well, you know, luckily I had very um, open-minded parents who never pushed any of the that you know uh, negative stuff on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and your mom was a singer, right? Or she's yeah. a musician as well? Yeah, my parents were uh, jazz jazz aficionados and fans. My mother was a jazz singer. Uh, my father just had a great record collection. Uh -huh. um, yeah, jazz blues. You know, my father had. You know, the mile, all the Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Stone Cold Train, Cannibal Adderley, you know, Wes Montgomery, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, all, mm -hmm. all that stuff, Sinatra, of course. And sure. My mother was a, uh, she's sort of retired from singing now, but she, she still teaches. Oh, wow. Um, but she, uh, she was like a Billie Holiday songbook kind of a wow. lady. You know, and, and I grew up playing behind her. She kind of raised me and my brother, who's a bass player, to you know be in her bands. So, um, well, that's cool. Like, how young were you when that started? Uh, I started playing my first like pro gigs with her 
when I was probably 15. Wow. Wow. I mean, I've been playing, uh, been playing out like concerts since I was 11, mm -hmm. but, um, getting paid, you know, actually <laughs> 15. Wow. You know, we started out doing things in church, like mm -hmm. wedding ceremonies. This was like, they were just starting to welcome the acoustic guitar into the church. You know, before that it had been like, you know, all the, or organ. only organ, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, this was the seventies were kind of opening up into like the folk mass thing where, you know, there'd be a bunch of acoustic guitar strummers on the stage with it a folk group, you know, singing the, the hymns instead of uh, organ. So that um, gave way for us to do, you know, wedding ceremonies where we do like the song that the people would choose, whatever, Cat Stevens, you know, mm -hmm. Peter, Paul and Mary, whatever they could choose. You know. And, you know, I was just happy to have my hands on my guitar and, and be, you know, playing music, making money. Mm -hmm. And, what was you know, what was the first change <laughs> yeah, right well but prior to you know playing guitar you what were a drummer and oh, yeah, I was a drummer. yeah i was a drummer first um you know when i first heard the beatles ringo of course i just that's what i wanted to do play drums play drums and um um then one day i picked up my brother's guitar my brother was the guitar player i was the drummer okay and uh, I picked up my brother's guitar one day and realized I could write songs on it without even knowing what I was doing. So I thought, well, I can't be stuck behind those drums over there. I got to be out in front. So uh, <laughs> I made my move and uh, I quickly kind of jetted past him. He had been studying for a, a year or two already. And I just mm -hmm. zoomed by and he said, hey, I'm going to switch to bass. And that was the best thing that could happen for us because... Yeah, we both still play a bit of drums. John, I, I taught him to play drums. He's actually probably a better drummer than I am now. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's important that we both had a foundation in rhythm first. Uh -huh. you know? Sure. Did he? Does musician. he still play? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, John. John's a great bass player. He's played with. Yeah, he's in, been in Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes for over a decade now. I wow. Think, I believe. Yeah. Where, where are you guys broadcasting from? Where do you live? Uh, Nashville now, but originally oh, okay. from San Diego. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we just moved here oh. about six months ago or so. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. We like it. We love it. Uh, it's yeah, different. I, different I thought, thought about Nashville, you know. Uh, I thought about coming to Nashville, but, you know, I think most people leave New York when they're frustrated with New York, when they're like, there's no work and there's no this and there's no that. <laughs> it has not been my experience. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, the venues have gone down. Right. The, the studios have gone down. The, you know, opportunities for work have definitely lessened it, everywhere in the music business, you know? Right. But um, I still love New York and uh, I ain't leaving. Anytime soon, <laughs> unless something like major, you know, happens, it makes me want to leave. But sure, sure. I mean, right now, still good. That's good. That's good. And uh, so you were, you started like you said professionally playing as a backup band with your mom. And uh, how did you, when did you like you went to school for music? Like talk to me about getting into where'd you go, Rutherford? I went to Rutgers. Oh, Rutgers. Sorry, Rutgers is. Um, I want to make sure you can see my beautiful Zemitis guitar over there. Say. Uh huh. <laughs> um, I went to Rutgers, yeah, because uh, you know, like I said, my father had all the West Montgomery records uh -huh. in my house, and um, so I grew up hearing that kind of guitar playing from when I was like five, whatever, you know, five, six years old, and um, that just stuck in my head. And when I got to be I kind of went through the whole, you know, self-taught rock and roll, you know, playing every gig, you know, that a kid could play when you're 13 through mm -hmm. 17, you know, my mom taking me to gigs in the station wagon, you know, um, playing the whatever teen centers and high school dances and swim clubs and battle of the bands. But then uh, my mom used to come into my room and uh, she would clean my room when I was a kid. 
And on the dust that would settle on the top of my desk, she would write jazz. And I would come back and I'd <laughs> wipe it off and I'd write rock. <laughs> so she was trying to get me, she was trying to get me into, you know, playing jazz, but I was like, well, you know, I don't want any part of that's your music, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But there came a certain point where, you know, beyond the, the church the gigs we were doing, like she was starting to play clubs and, and like full band gigs that, you know, she could hire me for, but I wasn't quite, you know, at the level that she needed somebody to be at. Mm -hmm. So I started studying. And uh, one of the first records I figured out by ear was Tequila by Wes Montgomery. You know, but that, 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 that. Uh -huh. but he played it with his thumb in octaves and, and uh, that I recorded that onto a cassette as my audition tape for Rutgers. And they heard that and they accepted me and gave me a scholarship. So I was like, wow, um, how, 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 what do I do here? Do I go to New York City and start a band? You know, I was out of high school. Do I go to New York City and start a band? I mean, this was still the era of, you know, pretty hard living New York rock and rollers, you know, mm -hmm. or go to college and get that free education and, you know, better myself. So I opted for option number two. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, that's what I did. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Well, I'm sure that you're happy with your parents probably were happy with that decision too. I guess. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I learned a lot. I mean, by the time I got out of there, my ear was so good. I mean, I had a, a keyboard harmony teacher, great jazz pianist, Kenny Barron. He was mm -hmm. my, and the guy is a you know major uh, star in the in the jazz world. If you don't know him, kids out there, look him up, Kenny Barron. He, you know he's uh, really a deep musician, and he taught me. I mean, by the end of my schooling there, you know he could play any chord, bang on the piano, and go, what kind of chord is that? And I could say, oh, it's a six nine sharp eleven. You know. Wow. That was my that was my ear training. Um, I still, you know, when I got out of there, I still can't really read notes that well. I mean, I can read them, but I can't sight read if you put a piece of, you know, music across a couple of music stands for me, which has happened on occasion on a session, okay. um, which scares the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at that. I will need to like take it away. Hey, give me an hour. I'll go figure it out and come back, you know? Right, right. But that's not the way it works in the studio. So I... I got called for the studio work I got called for was ear stuff and stuff where people would go make up a part, you know, that's what uh, I was okay. for, you know, what do you hear, you know? So, yeah. Was, well, yeah. So what was your first work in the industry outside of college? Um, I, my first road gig, mm -hmm. Let's see, I probably played a couple of like recording sessions on a couple of local records there in, in Jersey. And then my first major road gigs was with Blood, Sweat and Tears. Oh, wow. You know, the horn band from the, the late 60s. Yeah. Who were, it, it was like just the lead singer, David Clayton Thomas, and all like young kids, like fresh out of school, you know? Oh, did he just hire a bunch? Yeah, he kind of did like what Buddy Rich would do and, and all the sure. like jazz guys, they would you know, knowing that they had a reputation that kids would want to come out of school and and they knew that they were getting recruiting like guys that knew what they were doing because they were all right. Like know, classically trained, you know, or jazz trained, jazz maybe, trained. You know. off, yeah. And um, so, yeah, they. Um, yeah, it was all young guys, you know, in their 20s and, and this uh, original lead singer. And, you know, I figured me and my brother were in the band and we we had just come out of school where we were listening to, you know, all that classic bebop stuff, Coltrane and Bird and Miles and all that. But we were also listening to a lot of contemporary jazz like Mike Stern and Schofield and Jocko and all that. And at one time, Jocko Pistorius and Mike Stern had both played in Blood, Sweat and Tears at the same time. So that was our mantra. Just remember, Jocko and Stern played in this band. <laughs> so whenever it was going bad, we would think, we just have to remind ourselves, Jocko and Jocko and Stern, Jocko and Stern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long did you guys play with them for? Uh, it was uh, my brother did it a little bit longer than me. 
he did it probably two years or maybe a little more. I, I did it like a year, year and a half. Okay. And from there, did, were you in a band like of your own at this point too, or just focusing? I had on been, that? Uh, yeah, I had been um, recording demos. Okay. And like trying to get a record deal, but not knowing anyone in the, in the business, you know, I mean, that's, you know, half of, half of it is having the connections, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't have an uncle in the biz or a father <laughs> or a friend or any, sure. I knew absolutely no one. So, you know, I would do stuff like, and I still have all the rejection letters. You know, I would like take my cassette that, that I would record. I, I would go in, I went in the studio and recorded like a three song demo when I was like 20. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I sent those around just cold, you know, what looked in the phone book, you know, what's the address of Polygram Records, you know, <laughs> right. sent my lyric sheets and my cassette tape, you know, into them and, you know, got all the rejection letters back, which I still have. And then, you know, of course, later, whatever, almost 10 years later, I was signed to Mercury, which is kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but um, I think I've strayed from your question. Um, no, no. I would like so you Oh, you, so that's so that's what I was doing. I was like trying to get a record deal. Right. Um and had my own bands and I had started another band right outside and moved outside of New York City. I'd lived in um I moved from Madawan where I grew up, 50 minutes south to uh almost a part of Jersey City. It's called North Bergen. Mm -hmm. Um and that was about 5 minutes out. 10 minutes outside the city without oh, wow. traffic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it was easy to get in and out of the city and I would mm -hmm. uh, go in there and just try and hustle, you know, meet people and um, plan sessions and do, you know, Monday night jam gigs, you know, everywhere and sit in with people and just try and get known. Mm -hmm. And, um, while I was playing with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, I thought, all right, that's the way I'll make my, I'll make my living by playing with other people, and and I'll get my uh, my own thing together, you know, when I find the right people. Mm -hmm. And it took a couple years, uh, but I met um, the singer Keith Brewer, and my brother and I, we formed Company of Wolves, and got signed to Mercury, and you know. That must have been, us. That's, that's cool. That must have been really exciting, especially to have your brother in the band and then, you know, finally get signed to a record label. Yeah, that was, uh, I think I had been living in New York. I moved to New York in 86, officially, like, and within a month, I played on my first record for CBS. Wow. Like my first uh, session for a major label, which was great. Of course, I got the record back and they misspelled my name. <laughs> as, as happens to many people. Misspelled my name with an I, C-O-N-T-I. Don't do that. Um, and uh, yeah, and then within, I think, you know, I was just hustling, playing with everybody, going to auditions. And uh, I played with this guy, Glenn Burtnick for a while. Um, and uh, eventually I got the gig with Jill Jones. Mm -hmm. Jill was uh, the singer in Prince and Revolution. She sang the first line of uh, 1999. I was dreaming when I wrote this book and the other gonna stay. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was the waitress in Purple Rain. And okay. uh, so I became her musical director and guitar player. And we were supposed to tour with Prince, which never happened, fell through. But we rehearsed all summer long for eight hours a day, five days a week for wow. six months. And then uh, his uh, 87 Sign of the Times tour got canceled in the U.S. Um, and I was uh, playing with my blues band around town, just um, trying to meet people. And I met this guy, Jeff Kent who was a uh, sort of a great musician himself, keyboard player, songwriter, and a bit of a promoter. He wanted to start a, a jam night, like a blues jam night. And we started this thing at a club called Under Acme. And it went 
every Wednesday night it became a residency for like two years and everybody in town and even when they weren't in town, when they came to town from LA or wherever, they would come down and hang out. Julian Lennon, uh, Carol King sat in with us, Cindy Lauper, wow. Phoebe Snow, Willie DeVille, David Johansson when he was Buster Poindexter. I mean, so many, you know, the guys from the Letterman band, the Blues Brothers band. We met all the studio musicians in New York and that's how my brother and I started, you know, they all heard us play there and uh -huh. started hiring us. And that's where I met Keith. Keith Brewer, wow. the singer from Company of Wolves. Uh -huh. He came down and then we started writing songs. And so within, uh, that was 88. So within two years of moving to New York, um, we were being uh, looked at by record companies and got signed in 89, made the record, record came out in 90. And uh, did that for a few years, a couple of years then, right? A couple of years, yeah. yeah. And uh, as, as happens to many a New York band or many a band from anywhere, um, stuff changed at the record company. Mm -hmm. New president came in and was like, who's this band? And, right. Yeah. You know, but that happened, that, because, sure, that happened uh, because Nirvana came along and nobody wanted to know about a New York band. It was all about Seattle. Seattle and, and the know, grunge scene. And, <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I know there were some bands that immediately changed their whole look and sound. And uh, they all of a sudden, you know, these New York dudes who were, you know, wearing black leather jackets and look like the Ramones, all of a sudden they were wearing like uh, flannels and long shorts and, <laughs> and beards tied in a knot, you know, <laughs> and heroin. So I wasn't going to go that route. So I stopped, we started my own band with my brother, Crown Jewels, and we went on for bunch of years and did a bunch of records ourselves and mm -hmm. yeah wow and then you ended up joining what new york dolls when they reunited yeah that was uh let's see so That's 90 years later 92 but... yeah 92 we got out of uh, the deal with mercury mm -hmm. we floated around for a while tried to get resigned the band like i said didn't uh wasn't successful with getting resigned because no one wanted a New York rock and roll band. It's like mm -hmm. rock and roll, fun, good times, <laughs> like like memorable melodies and hooks. No, thanks. Right. We want wrist slashing, you know. I mean, I did like a lot of grunge stuff. I like Nirvana. I like Soundgarden. Mm -hmm. But uh, in general, the, you know, it was like singing about pain. Sure. You know, which... <laughs> I had plenty of them, so, right. so you know, I, 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 it kind of gave me a little license to bring some of my darker stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, we started the Crown Jewels and, and did that till probably 1999. And then, uh, and then we put out a record, The Contis, mm -hmm. in 2003, which is, I was playing with Willie DeVille. Yeah, from, from Company of Wolves, I went to Billy Squire because Billy Squire had heard the Company of Wolves record and he, he liked what I did, so he hired me for, and Keith, the singer, mm -hmm. uh, to sing backgrounds on his record and to um, play guitar. And then from Billy, I went to Willie DeVille. And then from Willie DeVille, I got the call from David Johansson to join the uh, New York Dolls that were reforming. It was just supposed to be for one gig. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that gig at Royal Festival Hall in London. And then uh, the bass player, original bass player, Arthur Killer Kane, passed away. And um, people had been calling saying, you know, come play this festival, come play that festival. But uh, without Arthur, um, you know, obviously, I guess David Sylvain had a choice to make. Do we continue without Arthur? I mean, it was Arthur's dream to put, have that band back together since mm -hmm. he was you know, since the band had ended in 1975, mm -hmm. you know, so it was almost 30 years. And uh, they decided to, in his honor, to go ahead. And so um, we soldiered on for another six years and four albums, you know, two studio albums, two live albums. And um, yeah, it was a nice run. That must have been exciting. I'm, I'm yeah. sure you're a fan of, of the band prior to joining. I actually didn't know much of the music. Um, really? Nope. 
Um, huh. I, I know it might sound weird, like being a New York guy, but yeah, New York was, rock and roller. I'm yeah, but I was I was more into <laughs> I was more into the British stuff. Okay. I was more into Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, mm-hmm. and Hendrix, Richie Blackmore. You know, like players. You know, real uh, you know blues players, guys with chops. You know, uh, I, I was that's. I grew up wanting to be a good musician, you know? Mm-hmm. So hearing a garage band, which I did, I heard the dolls when I was younger. Um, in fact, uh, quick story, their original drummer, his brother moved to my town of Matawan when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And he used to tell me, I look like Johnny Thunders. And I'd be like, who? He said, you don't know who Johnny Thunders is? And uh, he brought all the records to my house. And- Turned me on to Dolls, Criminals, Civil Lane's band, uh, the Heartbreakers, Thunder's band. And, um, you know, then 15 years later, I got the call from Joe Hansen. It was weird. That's but, crazy. Uh, but at the time, you know, I, I listened to it and I was like, okay. Um, it was just not complex enough for me. I was like in getting into things that were challenging. You know, if it wasn't mm-hmm. a challenge, like I wasn't really into it. I mean, I was teaching myself, you know, yes songs you know steve howe guitar Mm -hmm. solo pieces by you know by ear you know so playing a three chord garage song at that point wasn't uh something that was you know attractive to me i was gonna say it must be difficult when you have that skill set or like that skill level to kind of play more of the the you know power chord rock songs well is is it hard to like you know, you're probably no, used luckily, to spanning your mind like that. Well, luckily, um, I grew up with that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. I grew up with Stones, Beatles, Chuck Berry. Um, you know, simple. I mean, you have to start simple. Dylan, you know, I started with cowboy chords, you know, strumming the open strings and, you know, built the power chords and then, you know, built to learning the pentatonic scales and, you know, but by that, by the time that I had heard the the dolls, I was already like into, you know, much more complex stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, not that I had mastered, you know, because you can always get better at any, in any genre you're in. But mm-hmm. I kind of felt like I just want to keep moving up. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't want to get stuck in like the power chord pentatonic right. blues box for my entire life you know mm-hmm. which you know some guys have made a whole career on it some guys are older right. than me and that's all still all they can do you know sure. but that's fine if you make a living at it and you love it great mm-hmm. but i, I kind of thought you know i want to expand and and have other possibilities than just you know, i didn't think of it when i was a kid like how can i diversify my my talents you know? <laughs> right, it, was, right. it was just like i you got wanna, bored easily you know yeah, you I, was bored with, I, was, I was bored with three chord songs you know right but you know when you get older and mature and, and you, you realize there's a beauty in that and you try and play the shit out of those three chords can mm-hmm. i say shit yeah of course you can okay <laughs> <laughs> well how did you then get into the the anime world um that's another one of those stories where, you know, you, you, I like to say you hang around this crazy town long enough. Um, <laughs> you know, your reputation gets out there. People pass your name around like they did with David Johansson. You know, they, they, um, David asked a couple of respected guitar players, who should I call? And they said, Conti's the guy. Don't call anybody else. He's got the right guitars the right amps the right look Mm -hmm. right attitude and so when this yoko kano uh composer a really talented woman uh came to town i had no idea who she was um i got a call from her translator because she speak that well um, english that well and um they said, uh, we got your name from so-and-so, a drummer, a friend of mine, Jim. Um, he said, you're a good male rock singer. There's a, 
There's a woman here who's in New York. This guy had uh, recommended me. I sent an audition tape. She liked it. I went in, I sang. And she was doing a solo record. So I went and I sang a lead vocal on her solo record. Mm -hmm. And she really liked what I did. And then she said, I'm coming back in a couple of months to do a, a soundtrack for um, this new anime that's starting called Cowboy Bebop. I was like, I never heard of it. No one ever heard of it. So mm -hmm. I was like, sure, you know, call me. So um, she did. The first thing I did was sing live with a 30 piece orchestra which was a bit nerve wracking. You know? Wow. You're in the studio and, you know, studio is costing time. So you, you don't want to mess up and, and cost them money. You know, yeah. The uh, <laughs> hourly rate, you know, sure. You want to get it, nail it on the first or second take. So uh, that was uh, uh, easier than I thought, but it was pretty exciting. Um, and she loved what I did. So I kept, she kept calling me. I kept coming back and whatever. 20, 30 years later, however long it, I guess it's, it was about 1998. So yeah, 25 years later, it's like mm -hmm. one of the most classic animes ever. Right. Um, and uh, the only anime that I know of, at least at that time, that was made by the animators listening to our music first. The animation wasn't drawn yet. They, oh, they, really? They listened, yeah. They created the visuals based on our music. Interesting. So yeah. So so cowboy, listening to for, my voice for, that, for Cowboy Bebop, they, they didn't have anything. It was just yeah. Wow. I mean, maybe maybe they had like still fo photos, uh, still um, drawings of the characters, what the characters were going to look like, but nothing. They else. didn't like incorporate them into into the animation and and wow, doing the whole scenery and all that until our music kind of laid out the soundscape for them that's incredible yeah so uh, it was a interesting fact to learn. were you in were you into anime at all prior or uh just... i hadn't no really i hadn't really known much about it at all what about now i had that... seen some japanese cartoons when i was a kid like speed racer oh sure you know, like real early ones mm -hmm. um I mean, now my kids are into it. My kids are totally into it. That's but cool. Not because of me, you know. Right. I mean, when I, well, when I mean, I it's told, a huge culture. Yeah, it is a huge culture. And I've done some of the, um, you know, animation uh, conferences. And, That's cool. You know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty crazy, man. People, like, dress up like their favorite characters. You, you go right, to a all hotel. all the cosplay. <laughs> yeah, cosplay. You go to a hotel and it's just, like, filled, you know, from the minute you get to the front entrance you know through the the check-in desk down the hallways you know the ballrooms are just filled with these kids in these crazy costumes man they're just acting out their favorite you know players and hey that's cool better than knocking over a bank <laughs> right yeah, right exactly I'd rather, I'd rather see kids doing that right and, right and it's not only kids you know it's uh it's grown-ups adults you know? yeah i mean so. Comic Con was in San Diego every year, yeah. or it was, and it was fun to just go down there and and look at people watch. You know, they're all yeah. their crazy cosplay uniforms and costumes, and yeah, it's definitely a it's a scene for sure. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> I've, I've played at a few of those, and and people they they love the music from from those shows, and of course, you know, people ask me. You know, Am I going to play that stuff in my shows? I don't really play that in my shows. Like if I go play a, you know, show in New York or somewhere else with my music, I don't really mix the two. But if I go mm -hmm. to a, um, or I haven't really, I, I might consider it someday, who knows. But uh, if I do an anime conference, you know, it's like, I pretty much do whatever songs I can do. Because uh, a lot of them had orchestration, you know, mm -hmm. lots of strings and stuff, which is kind of hard. Sure. Um, but I'll do as many of the anime songs as I can do, like, and then fill in my set with uh, whatever original songs of mine mm -hmm. um, fit, you know, along That's with cool. it. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, speaking of your solo stuff, uh, talk to me about this record you have coming out. When did it, when did the process on it start? Was it after oh, COVID happened or? It's, I started recording it September 2019. 
So oh, okay. we had no clue what was about to happen, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I recorded the tracks in, in Brooklyn with my brother, John on bass and Charlie Drayton on drums from Keith Richards' Expensive Winos and Replacements, The Vinyls, P-52 is a great drummer. Amazing. Wow. Um, and we cut the tracks and then I overdubbed in my own studio. I did my own guitar stuff and also worked with my producer, co-producer, Andrew Hollander, uh, in his studio to do some vocal stuff. And we finished up by February 2020 when I had to leave and go on the road. I had to go over to Finland because I was playing with um, Michael Monroe, who I'd been playing with. Mm -hmm. We didn't really talk about him yet. but um, So I went over there to do a tour and we were about halfway into a six week tour and we got the word you know that covid was raging and they were going to close the borders and so i bailed out and came home luckily the record the recording was all done so all i had to do at that point was like finish whatever editing i was going to do and then send it to my mixer and i pretty much spent the mix the summer of 2020 um in the netherlands back and forth on the computer with my mixer who was in LA nine hours behind me. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, this is probably the, the fifth or sixth album I've mixed this way. So I'm kind of used oh, to Oh really? <laughs> this yeah. isn't new. <laughs> no. This has been happening since yeah, 2010, I think was, you know, the first album I did with Michael Monroe. He we recorded it in LA and then he went home to Finland and, and mixed it there and we were uh, we were all well, whoever lived in the States was well, over here and he would send mixes back and forth. What do you think of this? Uh, too much bass, uh, not enough drums, whatever. Comments flying back and forth until we got it right, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's how I mixed this record. And it's called Bronx Cheer. It's mm -hmm. going to come out on little Steven Van Zandt's label, Wicked Cool Records. It drops November oh, yeah. 5th. Yeah. And we've had two singles out already, Recovery Doll which was the first single, which has a video out, a crazy virtual reality video. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I checked it out. Yeah, because uh, well, I couldn't get into a, a studio with a, a band or a video director. Right, or right. So I was like, okay, how am I going to make a video for this song? And um, the director, producer had an idea. He said, uh, let me just, I was thinking about like stills. Should we have a bunch of still photos and lyrics, you know? He's like, I got an idea. Let me try something. So he built this whole, all these virtual humans and virtual wow. sets. And it, yeah, I mean, some, some of them, you can't believe they're not real people, but mm -hmm. yeah. That's really cool. And then I got a new, uh, a new single out, Dog Days of Summer, mm -hmm. just in time for the Dog Days of Summer. <laughs> and uh, I have a video coming for that, which won't come out until the fall. Uh, well, okay. into the fall, unfortunately, but um I basically I have a single coming out every month until the album drops. That's so amazing. Next week, next week, there's going to be another single coming out. Mm -hmm. September 10th. That's Friday. I don't know when this is going to air. When is this airing? Oh, uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah, we can do it however, whenever you want it to air. <laughs> uh, so this might be out of sequence to you people at home. If you've already heard my latest single, I'm not going to tell you the name of it now, but... Uh, <laughs> comes out September 10th and right. then there's another single coming out October whatever first week in October I think they're all Fridays okay and uh and then the another record. one coming out in November and then the album finally comes out in full in November and people can pre-order it now Bronx Cheer you can go to my page on Bandcamp if you want to order a um signed copy oh cool I know it's going to be vinyl LP and CD and the digital is also available from the label Wicked Cool Records. They have a page on Bandcamp or on their website, wickedcoolrecords.com. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, I can't yeah. wait to, to hear the, the record. So it's been mixed, you said, kind of, but you've worked this way before remotely. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> okay. It's a no brainer, really. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it just takes a little more time than if you were sitting right there with the guy, you know, and you can right. just say, just push that up a little or just pull that back a little. Right. 
Yeah. Well, talk talk to me about Michael Monroe real quick, because I forgot that you you played with him for quite a long time, right? Yeah. Well, after the Dolls, uh, well, what happened was the Dolls' work was slowing down, mm-hmm. and so um, I just had a kid. So I was like, uh, my work cannot slow down right now. You know, mm-hmm. I need to keep going. Mm-hmm. And so the uh, bass player of the Dolls had been was originally in Hanoi Rocks with Michael, Sammy Yaffa. Mm-hmm. They started that band, Hanoi Rocks, together when they were kids. And so Sammy had started playing with Michael again. And Sammy uh, asked me to come and fill in. They just needed a guitar player to fill in. And I went and I did a couple gigs with them and uh, they really liked what I did. So they asked me to join. Uh, I said, well, I'm in the Dolls. You know, I'll do both as long as I can. And um, just so happened that when the Dolls called to do their next album, it was starting exactly on the same date that Sammy and I had been booked to start the new Michael Monroe record. Exactly the same day. They said, <laughs> OK, we're going to be in England on uh, September 10th. And we said, no, we, we can't do that. We're in Los Angeles on September 10th. Mm-hmm. So. Um, at that point, they got somebody else. I never officially left the band. They never fired me. It just sort of went one thing morphed into another. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been with Michael ever since because wow. his work has been, uh, you know, just getting better and better as we as we write as a band and you know bring in uh, bring in good material and Mm -hmm. make great records. So amazing. And Michael has had uh, a bit of uh, fame over there on uh, being the, one of the judges on the voice of Finland. Oh, cool. I didn't realize, you know, the voice, yeah. Voice over here and voice Uh everywhere, voice of England, voice of Holland. It's the same show. So uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a good run. Um, That's going on. Wow. Last year was, was would have been our 11th summer but wow. we haven't worked in two summers because of covid right wow which is crazy because uh you know summer is the big time for us finland has about 150 music festivals and we play probably half of them every year oh wow i didn't realize that in addition to you know whacking or walking in germany mm-hmm. um you know festivals in the uk festivals in Italy and Spain, you know, we were scheduled on a bunch of dates with Guns N' Roses that got canceled, stadiums, you know. Yeah, it's been a, a real shit couple of years. Sure. COVID, you know. mm-hmm. Have you had a chance to play at all yet? I've played, um, let's see, one, two. I've played two cover gigs. Wow, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I played, it was one like outdoors at a at like a bar restaurant in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. It was really fun. It was me and my brother and our drummer friend, Rich Pagano, who we played with for years. And we just did, you know, all of our favorite classics, you know, Stones, Who, mm-hmm. you know, Blues stuff, Credence, whatever. Um, and then another was a, uh, it was a private party, um, more of an acoustic gig. Mm-hmm. but uh i'm about to do some some gigs this fall uh september and october with uh, rockabilly legend robert gordon i don't know if you know his stuff but Mm-mm. um another you know big like following in the footsteps gig for me like like blood sweat and tears was you know following in the in the shoes of mike stern you know mm-hmm. uh with robert gordon it's uh being in the shoes of Link Ray and Chris Spedding, who are two of my favorite guitar players and absolute legends. So actually Chris recommended me, Link passed away a long time ago, but uh, Chris Spedding, who is, is the guy who pretty much, uh, I don't know if he discovered him, but he recorded the Sex Pistols for the first time. Oh, wow. And he's, you know, played with Paul McCartney, Elton John. I mean, he's like a British session. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. legend sure great great guitar player and uh it was an honor that he recommended me for robert so i'm going to be doing some um of those gigs with robert 
which are great because they, you know, they're kind of a uh, rockabilly to me is like a great combination of like rock and roll, mm -hmm. blues, country and jazz mm -hmm. and four things that I love to do and I get to combine them all. It's not like just punk. Yeah, it's straightforward. Yeah. Right. Sure. Well, that's so. amazing. Well, very exciting. Very exciting. I can't wait to hear the, the rest of the record. And I appreciate you being here, Steve. This has been awesome. My pleasure. Um, let us know when, uh, when this is going to air, and I'll make sure that I you know, post it out to all Love my it. various uh, sites and everything. I enjoy that. That would be awesome. Uh, I have one more question for you before I let you okay. go. Do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Um, yeah. Wow. You know, the biz is so different now than it was when I was coming up. I mean, back when, you know, when I was a kid and I was looking at, you know, the, at, at my idols, you know, you could actually think about making, I, it, my goal was never to make money. Really, it was, uh, you know, to get my music out. And, you know, I was into rock and roll and rock and roll was, was a big thing you know all my growing up and now it's probably this much of the uh, of the market you know music you know it's hip-hop and pop and kid stuff and rap and whatever so um there was a real chance to like do it you know when you were a kid coming up in the 70s 80s even 90s you know but now uh i think you you got to be really focused on a lot of other stuff besides music, unfortunately, like business and social media and marketing and promotion and all that and hashtags and, <laughs> you know, partnerships. And, um, you know, I, I do my best with that, uh, when I can. And, um, but the main thing is always, you still got to have the talent and, you know, I see it over and over again with, with kids. They, they just want to, oh, okay, I wrote a song. Can this be on YouTube tomorrow? And can we start selling it on iTunes? And that, you know, like, no, 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 no. You know, I mean, I do this with my son who's 12 and he's a great singer and songwriter, but, you know, kids, they have no idea. They just see that that's what happens. Like some kid comes out like Justin Bieber whatever, 12, you put it on YouTube, get discovered, boom. Well, you know, it doesn't always happen like that. You have to develop your talent. So, you know, number one, develop that talent and, and study and, and practice and get good at, at your craft. Take apart songs if you're a songwriter, figure out what makes them great. Um, if you're a singer, you know, sing along with your favorite artists. You know, you're going to or a guitar player, you know, it always starts with mimicry, but then you got to, at some point, just do your own thing. Um, but you really develop the, uh, the musical talent part of it, along with the technology. And I think most important of all, be a good person, because there's so many a-holes in this business um, who will step all over you, and uh, use you to get where they're going. Uh, those people get no respect. I mean, maybe they get success, but I don't know. It doesn't, uh, in the long run, you know, I, I believe in karma, you know? Um, and I think whatever you do comes back to you. So, you know, be a good person, be talented and work hard. <laughs>